<laughs> so welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 16th of April, uh, 2014, and um, we are delighted to be talking about this book, Thrive, um, Minu Ram's book um, that came out, it came out in March, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, Mino's here with us. Um, very brave of her. I feel like I should have it. my copy. I don't have a copy. <laughs> you don't have a copy? Oh, yeah, that's really wrote it. It's downstairs. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, I don't know. A, a few weeks ago when I asked Mino, uh, like, uh, who's somebody you'd like to hear from who you don't usually hear from? She said, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you said something like, it would be great to hear some pre-service teachers. Um, young teachers because I don't know how they're taking this. So Cindy was sitting at a table nearby um, and, and um, as part of ed educate, what is it, innovator or educator uh, work that we were doing in Washington. And um, and I asked Cindy and Cindy's using the book and I guess not yet but you asked a couple of your students to jump in. Is that yes, correct? our overachievers yes. are looking ahead and um, volunteered to have, be part of the conversation, so I'm really excited about that, and for you to meet them, Minu. I, I really appreciate um, you taking the time to, to have a conversation about this. That means a lot to me. Thank you. And Chris Sloan is here with us as well. Um, should we, uh, Cindy, why don't we start with you introducing yourself and your students, and then Minu will let you talk. Sure. I'm Cindy O'Donnell Allen and I'm a professor at Colorado State University in the English department and I also direct the CSU Writing Project. I'm a member of the Educator Innovator work that National Writing Project is doing along with Chris and Paul too and Minu. Great. And Clint just, oh no, I thought you disappeared there Clint, but there you are. And Clint and Jenna are my students, I'll let them introduce themselves. Great. Jenna, go ahead. Oh. Um, my name is Jenna Allen, and I'm going to be doing my student teaching next semester. And so I really appreciate reading Minu's book because I feel like not a lot of the books that we've read so far have really addressed the concerns of pre service teachers. And so I think this really hits on some of the concerns that we've had as a group. Mm -hmm. Clint? Uh, yeah, so I'm Clint Finley, also student teaching in the fall. Yeah, in the fall. Um, don't yeah, and like Jenna said, excited was excited to read this book and get into the conversation about it. So, are you guys juniors or what are you, at Colorado? Seniors, uh, technically, I guess she's a grad student. No, I I'm a post bachelor's student, so I did my undergrad at CSU, and then I went on to University of Colorado at Boulder, and then I came back to CSU to do my license. So, I'm at the end of my school days, thankfully. <laughs> And your English majors, or what? What's your majors? Just yeah, English. Great. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, uh, Chris. Do you want to say hello? Hi. Uh, Did you finish? By the way, I, two, two days I ago you were in chapter three. Huh? Oh, I finished Minu's book. Yeah, I finished <laughs> okay. it uh, today, as a matter of nice. fact. Um, sure. Uh, I my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And yeah, I just finished Minu's book. <laughs> cool. So Minu, wel welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself? I sure. think people know who you are, but go ahead. <laughs> no, sure. Uh, um, my name is Minu Rami. I teach my students English at the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm also a teacher consultant with the Philadelphia Writing Project through the National uh, Writing Project. Um, I'm part of some of the, you know, Educator Innovators uh, network work that NWP is doing. Um, but I think, uh, I think I think of myself as a learner uh, more so than anything else. So um, some of the people that are on this call, I've learned a ton from uh, through conversations, but um, just watching their work online. Um, I actually asked Chris for his students uh, link because I want to know what he's doing and um, how can I get my kids to write the way he gets his kids to write. So um, for me this is this is a, a, a really um, amazing 
um, opportunity, and, and I'm thankful for Paul and Cindy and, and Clint and Jenna and Chris um, to take the time out and, and just give me some feedback on, on something that I've worked really hard on and, and for a while. Um, and now that um, people are reading it, I'm getting all kinds of feedback. So um, it's fascinating and, and humbling, and, and I'm thankful. Can you talk a little more about that? Like, what's the conversation like? I, I know to, I know your schedule is pretty filled. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, even even before the book um, came out, people were you know lining me up for PD or or speaking um, opportunities, and um, I think a lot of what the book addresses um, maybe. Maybe especially the the challenges the book acknowledges acknowledges um, how teachers may be feeling depleted or maybe feeling tired or maybe tired by the negative rhetoric around the work that they're doing um, with their students. Um, I'm seeing that um, you know actually in in the faces of the people that I meet um, and and. and but at the same time, um, so many people have reached out and have said, um, "Like this is this is actually helpful, and this is making me reframe some things that I'm doing." And and that's nice to hear. Um, so I, I, I'm seeing, I guess, both sides of the situation. I'm seeing both the both the lack of morale, but I'm also seeing some hope and and positive energy um, not just because of the book but just you know teachers when they gather they're excited to share what they're doing and and what makes them tick um, and I'm seeing that as well so I guess I'm seeing both when I'm, when I'm meeting people so by the way um, we don't go in any particular order here so uh, please interrupt um, and be bold to do that um, and you can leave your mic off are on and because I love the uh, talking on top of each other. Um, Aaron, I'm from New York. I can do it. Um, Aram, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? I jumped in here. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Okay, I am a seventh grade English teacher. First of all, I'm Aram Cambodian. Uh, I uh, teach in East Lansing, Michigan at uh, McDonald Middle School. And I'm a member of the writing project here, a uh, national uh, um, Red Cedar writing project. I um, met Mino in Washington, D.C. Uh, recently at the, the annual meeting of the writing project and uh, was very intrigued uh, by uh, what she had to say. And I flipped through her book and uh, have uh, now bought it and uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, work my way through it. Yeah, you got to show the book or you can't be honest. <laughs> We can just make that my picture if you want. <laughs> so, so, Mino, your introduction got me right away to something I wanted to kind of push back on. And then sure. we lost we lost our, our pre-service teachers. But can you – I'm going to start this question this way. Can you describe some of the – like, I experience you as a deeply political person. Right, as an educator, can you describe some of the politics that are going on in Philadelphia right now? Oh yeah. Um. Hi again. Yeah. Hi. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, Philadelphia. Um, you know, when you when you think about um, budget cuts, um, we're we're down to the bones, and I think even our bones are are being cut through. So there isn't any any extra fat to cut anymore. Um, in the past couple of years we've closed um, as many as 30 or more schools. Um, I think there is a there's a there's a deep um, mistrust between teachers and our governor. Um, and the policies that are in place um, are so um, uneven and ineffective when it comes to equity and funding. Um, so you could be um, 
you know, you could be on one block in, in Philadelphia, and then the next block would be Lower Marion, which is a surrounding suburb um, at the edge of the city line. And the funding between the two two districts and the two schools that are like across the street from one another um, are so drastic, and it makes you it makes you wonder. Um, and it's not just about the the money. It's like things like not having working water fountains. Like um, I haven't worked in a school that has had a librarian um, since like my. I think actually I've never worked in a school that has that had a school librarian. Um, like there aren't like the things that make up. A, a school experience like art and music and sports um, we have none of or very little of um, and it's this um, it's kind of like let's create a problem so bad that we can make these drastic policies about um, about teaching and learning that everyone will be so focused on the crisis at hand that maybe they'll ignore some of the very, you know, high-level changes that we're making. Um, we are set to lose our seniority. We're set to take a 15, uh, 13 to 15% pay cut in the coming year, and we're, we're not making a ton of money. So, um it's a tough time to be a student and a teacher um, in the school district, um, and our and our students are very much aware of this inequity, and and I think that's hard thing for them to live through as well, um, because I think I think what does that say to a kid when they see that inequity across the street um, in fields in you know, after school learning opportunity. So even if um, even if you're on the positive side of that inequity, it's yeah, it's right. And uh, so the political climate in in Philadelphia is 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 as bad as I've seen in last eight years. Um, and and I think um, I think one so that's of that's how things, long you've been teaching, you know? Yeah, years? that's yeah, that's how long I've been teaching. Um, and one of the things that I've been urging teachers to do, not just in my district but wherever I go, is to go public with with their with the stuff that's working in their classroom and 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 the things that they're facing, the real challenges that teachers are facing. I think that the dialogue around education and educational reform is so heavily dominated by people with much larger bank accounts than teachers that they're monopolizing that conversation and I think um, I think we need to think about in very real ways how can we have an active voice and, and have uh, a certain level of participation in that dialogue. Um, I, it worries me that you know film directors and musicians like deem themselves as policy experts on um, education, but people, you know, people with a ton of classroom experience and people like Cindy who teach teachers, like, you know, why aren't they, why don't they have that same weight in, in the conversation? That worries me a little bit. So could guys could we stay here a little bit? Like, what are the current conditions? I mean, we can we can say quickly that your book I think is very upbeat, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Given the conditions you just put out there. Yeah, so, that but, contrast but, is dark. Yeah. yeah, that contrast is dark. Mm. And I think I think in some ways, um, a lot of what I'm saying I in the book I say to myself to keep going, um, <laughs> which is which is kind of funny. Um, but I think it's I think it's true. I think I think I closed the book with with that. Like some people would say, I'm crazy to say this is the mm -hmm. best moment mm -hmm. to be a teacher. But I but I think it is because um, I've had positive experience because I'm able to have conversations like this w with you, and 
um, I don't feel so alone and I don't feel so powerless or voiceless. Um, I think I think if I did, if I was disconnected, and I think I was, if I did, if I felt disempowered, I may say, I may agree, like this isn't the best time to be a teacher. Um, but I think because um, I have I have worked hard to find my voice. I have worked hard to um, to to actually own what I believe about teaching and learning. Um, maybe I feel like I have a little more hope than I would otherwise. So Jenna and Clint, what are you getting yourself into? <laughs> 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 this a good question. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Do you? Uh, but uh, do the uh, do the conditions of teaching and learning in schools feel the way Minu described in Colorado also, or what do you? Uh, I think that as far as I mean, we're in Fort Collins, which is I think it could be viewed as both positive and negative. It's a very affluent community. Um, and since and so we work mainly in those schools with our uh, even before our student teaching, um, and so those students are all pretty privileged. So in Fort Collins, it's not a huge dichotomy, but there are schools know. even in our community, like yeah. Cindy works at Irish Elementary that yeah. has a large population of like ELL learners and stuff. And then Denver is getting significantly more diverse as well as the schools on the plains, because the schools on the plains have a large community of farm workers. Um, so I think it's becoming, especially in recent years, even more so to the same, like in the same sense that me was writing or talking about. I think, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like even working in, in Loveland where I am right now, there's there's a, a sense where working with other student teachers, they see all the bureaucracy and students, you know, special ed students are being left behind and it can be really disheartening. And, you know, you're thinking about the standards that are coming up, working the core standards into the curriculum, and you're going to be evaluated as a teacher, and the principal's going to come in and be looking for all these things. And it's just, you look at the papers, and, you know, the evaluation for teacher's form is, like, 20 pages long. And so you're wondering, as a student teacher, how am I going to keep track of all this? Like, how am I going to do all of this in my one lonely classroom? And I think Nina's answer which is really helpful is you don't have to do it alone. And so it's I've seen from other student teachers that it can be really frustrating just on a bureaucratic level. Um, I think so even yeah. just to make sense of the policy, like there are like three different systems you turn in grades on. There are like two mm -hmm. different attendance systems. Like I think one of the hardest things for me when I started out teaching was just like to manage all the paperwork and like just the different protocols that you you have to follow um, I don't know how you can figure that out if you don't have an in-school mentor who says well like okay actually that form doesn't get filled out till April and you better hold on to it and like or, you'll need that or even says yes you're asked you're asked to do that but you know nobody's going to notice if you don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think before we move on, I think uh, Aram has some, uh, you know, from Michigan, I, I'd mm -hmm. like to hear yeah, his what's going take on, on things, yeah. right? Because um, I think some of, because uh, I talked to some of the Red Cedar people uh, not too long ago, and I think, Aram, if I'm not wrong, I think your story might have some similar echoes as Minu's. Aram, are you there? He may be frozen. Well, <laughs> so I you think, you know, I mean, Michigan is facing a lot of similar obstacles. Um, before we moved on to the, you know, the resiliency part of things. So, Arm, when you come back, you can talk to that. Um, we have to go out and come back in again. So, uh, do you think that this book will give you a platform to, I don't know, you're not going to address all those problems, but at least talk about them as well? And, yeah. I mean, you've answered that already a little bit, Nina, but... Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've, I don't think I'm offering any, like, <laughs> any, like, 
answers or or panacea of any type. I think I think I'm more reflecting back on my experience and experience of other teachers, and um, I think I'm I think I'm suggesting that teachers figure those answers out for themselves because they are such local issues and like what Fort Collins is is in Philadelphia and is in Detroit. So I think in each ecosystem of schools and and districts, I think teachers have to again be the champions of their students and of, of themselves and and offer another another side of the story or or another way of looking at the situation or offer another vision actually I think it's even bigger than that I think I think we can't say like that's not good enough like you know like we can't just complain about what's not right mm -hmm. I think we have to like step up and offer some solutions and uh, again I think uh, Jenna and Clint like I think it's incredible that you picked up on it the idea that you don't go at it alone and that it's quite impossible to do so. Um, you know, I feel like my experience and my journey as a teacher would be incomplete without all the people that I've met along the way and people that I've sought out and have tried to learn mm -hmm. from and learn with. Um, so I think I think that's incredible that that also resonated with you, that it doesn't just happen for one person by themselves. Uh, Mino, if I could just ask you to talk a little bit more about, I mean, part of this, something I heard you say yesterday just because we were coincidentally in a, <laughs> a webinar together yesterday um, with Paul as well, was um, that it's important to spread the good news about yeah. the, the learning that's going on because it, it really is easy to perseverate on all the things that are going wrong in Philadelphia and in Michigan, and it seems like everywhere, um, yeah. you know, things are are becoming more restrictive. There's this feeling that, you know, you aren't being observed maybe in the classroom um, to support you as a teacher, but to be judged and evaluated and figuring out whether you're damaging kids. I mean, that's not necessarily. My husband's a principal, and that certainly isn't the way that he sees evaluation. Um, but it is some places, you know. It's yeah. like somebody, someone's the police, is it, is and they're it checking like up on you. Somebody going to catch you, or exactly. Yeah. But but you're advocating for opening your door, and um, as you said, sharing the good news in the um, in the webinar we had yesterday. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I I feel like I feel like we we understand the importance of focusing on what's working but when it comes to talking about our own work um, we very much leave that piece out so we'll start our classrooms and we'll start our advisories with good news like hey guys like what's going on that's awesome like share something amazing in your life or in your experience or in your learning um, but we don't we rarely uh, I think sometimes teachers can be too humble um, and, and sometimes that can get in the way of, of the conversation too. I feel like the good work that's happening around around the country, like I, I think people don't know about it because I feel like teachers feel like self-conscious or they feel like, oh my God, is the teacher next door going to judge me because like I shared this or I got like recognized for this. There's a little bit of fear of that. like. How are my colleagues going to deal with it if there is a little bit of spotlight on me? And I feel like all of that gets in the in the way of like like you said very eloquently, like sharing what is working in our classrooms. I think I, I think parents, I think policymakers, I think politicians need to need to know like how hard teachers work every day to create a thoughtful. Um, and impactful learning experiences for their kids. And I think a lot of that stuff is happening despite 
all the challenges we're currently facing. And I, I feel like if we share the, I think the dialogue around education and education reform would be slightly different than it is right now. Or at least that's, that's my, that's how I'm viewing it. That may or may not be true, but that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I would like to see dropped is the whole notion that there are good and bad teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, from, from President Obama down, I, you know, there's a lot of talk about who's a bad teacher, who's a good teacher, and that category makes no sense. And that doesn't come up in your book either. It's not like you're a bad teacher. You're, you're a teacher who's trying to connect more. You're a teacher who's getting help. You're a teacher who's growing and, and developing. So everybody's a developing teacher. Like, there aren't good and bad trees, right? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Good. I, th I think I think that's actually really interesting the 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 idea of good good and bad teachers. I think like if a kid if a student is struggling in your class, like you're not going to put the label bad on them and right. then like you know like do three observations on them and then like find a way to show them to the door. Like you're going to keep trying. But at the same time, um I would I would argue that the most impactful um, gains I've made as a teacher have been because of learning I took on for myself, not necessarily like, you know, somebody saying, hey, like, you should go do that or you should, you know, um, I think, I think like when, just like when our students are, motivated like by their curiosity or their hunger for something um, they grow much more when learning is like that I think same is true for us so I think I think labeling is misdirected and and poorly used in for many reasons but one of the most you know often ignored ways probably is that it's like it's like useless to do that. Like if you label someone that, they're not going to be like more motivated to like take more risk or work mm -hmm. harder or do more engaging stuff with their students. That That's just going to turn them off more. But m I think one of my inquiries um, is like what, what does motivate teachers? When, what, mm -hmm. how does that growth or that change or, or the that kind of like inherently motivated learning happen for teachers. Um, I'm curious about that. Um, I'm thinking a lot about that. Um, and it'd be it'd be interest. I'd be interested in hearing what other people think. Jenna and Clint, just jump in with whatever you're thinking. Of. But if, if you want to talk about what motivates you to grow as a teacher, that'd be cool too. All right. Uh, I think for me, yeah, uh, right now at least a big part of it is actually all of the educational reform and uh, policies that are going on because I think that it's more than anything inciting the conversation about educational reform mm -hmm. and like experimentation within your uh, teaching style. And I think it's getting more teachers out of their comfort zones, at least in my experience within the schools uh, and PSD. A lot of teachers that I had seen before are doing completely different things, trying to, I think, both meet these new standards, but also kind of start thinking about how they can best reach their students in new ways. Um, and I think that's partly administration, but I also think it's partly because they realize there's, it's, uh, they're, I, I think that they're trying to move farther away from the idea of the standardized tests saying all about how your students are performing. So at least for me, that's the exciting part, is that the more people I talk to, the more excited they are about trying new things, or at least the teachers that I'm being surrounded by. That's so nice. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I'm motivated by fear, right? <laughs> yeah, that's Where it's like, that? yeah. I mean, I, I go into a classroom and, yeah. well, I mean, I, I, I I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid of like disappointing the students and like not getting them prepared for that next step. Where, you know, if they don't learn what I have to teach them right now, like I'm going to send them off to 
the next grade and they're not going to know what's going on. And so I guess I'm motivated out of, I mean, it's embarrassing to say, but I'm motivated out of a fear. Like, I'm going to let these students down. They're not going to learn. They're never going to learn how to use a semicolon or they're always going to splice their commas. And it's, it's going to be their, you know, the shame will be upon me. <laughs> Mina, you talk a lot about fear in your book, though. Um, I do. I do. And Minu, oh, there you are. I was going to say you had disappeared on my screen. For no, a I'm, I'm right here. Um, you talk a lot about fear in your book and about um, vulnerability and modeling that for your students. I would love to hear you describe what that looks like. Can, is there something that happened recently in your classroom that would allow us to get a more concrete view of that? You know, I mean, there there are lots of you know, there are lots of times um, when I try things and they don't they don't work in the classroom. Whether I'm like applying game design to storytelling or I don't know, like take take anything. Almost every single thing that has come out of my classroom that I've shared with you, with others in the National Writing Project, almost you know, till the moment it actually like came to some final concluding moment, it was a big question whether it was going to work or not, um, whether it's the teen magazine. But take any practice of mine that, that I've been sharing a lot or talking a lot about. Um, I, I think um, I think there are, I think there are like all kinds of um, all kinds of fears that that teachers face. You know whether it's like you know fear of failure or fear of like not being accepted. You know by their students. I think what Jenna actually described is like what what lots of teachers feel, but don't necessarily articulate even to themselves it's the fear of disconnect right like you get up and you stand in front of kids and you're talking and you can tell you're not connecting mm -hmm. like like every teacher has been in that position where there are like blank stares kids are looking at phones they're looking at clocks and you're like oh my god like whatever I have planned is not working so what you know I call that like fear of failure in the in the classroom, like whether it's losing control or rejection. I think it's one of our deepest fear that the work that we do with our kids don't matter. I think we fear like criticism from our colleagues, fears of like standing out and taking an uh, uh, unpopular position in a community. And then, like, ultimately, the fear of, like, having to do all the work. Like, if you're always coming up with the best ideas, you always get stuck implementing them. <laughs> and then you are you are that guy in, in the meetings. Um, so I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of um, fears of all types, like pu public and private. But I think when, when like, when you align like what you really believe about teaching and learning to your practice you can overcome some of those fears so like for example one of my one of my deepest beliefs about learning is that failure is common it will happen and like it's just as like everybody says this but like how many times do we actually how many times are we actually willing to fail in front of our kids? Mm -hmm. Like, it, we all say, like, oh, but you can learn so much more from the things that you fail at than the things that work for you. But how many times we a do we actually do that? Um, you know, so he here's, here's, an, here's a concrete example of when I feel vulnerable or when I feel um, like sometimes I fail in front of my kids. Um, Kelly Gallagher a long time ago um, taught me that like if you want to be a good teacher of writing you have to write in front of your kids like mm -hmm. actually have like a blank document up on the big screen and whatever you're trying to teach them 
like how to write opening of an essay, how to write thesis statements, how do you, whatever you're trying to teach them, how do you write a transition, whatever it is that you're trying to teach them. Even if it's not one of those concrete things, you're just trying to teach writing of some kind, you have to write in front of your kids. It means like you actually stand there with a blank dog and the cursor blinking and like 33 people looking at you like what is she doing um, and you write and I've done this and I do this and I do this quite often and it's scary like every time I do it I'm like oh my god like because I'm like constructing and deleting and editing and I'm making my thinking visible and I'm thinking about changes and I, I know it's not as good as it can be and I know it's not Kelly Gallagher is, I know it's not Penny Kittle so like I have that like over my head and um, I know um, that like I am exposing my vulnerability and I'm opening up my process as a writer um, to my kids um, but I I think there's no other way um, to to do this I think if we don't I think if we don't model vulnerability, how do we expect kids to be vulnerable with us? Um, like if if I'm if I don't feel comfortable saying like, hey, I don't totally get this. I'm trying to figure it out too. How are we making room for room for in our classes for kids to say, hey, I'm confused too. I don't get it. There's um, a book written. Um, Called Reading for Understanding, as some of you guys might know, uh, co-authored book a, a while ago. It's a really, really great book. Cynthia Greenleaf is one of the co-authors on that, um, and she worked with a high school in the East Bay area, um, and some of the work they were doing with kids was really supporting them with their academic reading. One of the things that the phrase that they took up together as with these kids was, "It's cool to be confused." Yeah. Um, and it doesn't seem like it, you know, it doesn't necessarily feel cool in the moment, but if you don't do that, you're not, you aren't learning. If, it all, if you always feel comfortable, I think, you aren't learning. Yeah. I've gotten much, much better with awkward silences in the classroom, too. Like, <laughs> when I first started, it would be, like, 10 seconds, and I'd be, like, oh, my God, like, I would feel, like, heat on my face and I'd be like oh my god I have to like end this silence like why is why aren't they talking now we'll go like for a long time and it'll be like really awkward but I'll just wait my wait time has gotten better um there's this there's one more thing I wanted to talk with you about meaning well maybe there are a lot of things but this at this moment this seems like a good time to ask you this question um I, I'll start with a, an example. Um, yesterday, one of my colleagues, Clinton, Jenna, know her. She's this amazing teacher, Pam Coke. Um, she's fantastic. See, look, they think she's fantastic. Look at the expressions right. on their faces. Anyway, she and I were talking yesterday morning um, about a class she had had. And so this amazing teacher had this class that she felt was such a failure this was her personal experience, uh, you know, perception of it, that she had to give herself a timeout <laughs> during the class. And she, you know, you can do this in a university classroom. She had a, a teaching assistant, so she just basically turned to him and said, I've got to leave the classroom and kind of <laughs> go out on a little walk and come back um, because in that moment, this, this uh, lesson that she had worked on forever and spent all this time, invested all this energy in, was just falling flat. She felt like the, <coughs> the students weren't engaged and it was just that, um, an example I think of what you talk about in the book where we are so invested in our teaching, and but even really great teachers can try something that on paper and inside our heads, you know, just looks like a surefire success. Mm -hmm. But in the classroom, in that moment, for whatever reason, doesn't feel that way. And you t you say that you still have those moments, right? Mm -hmm. In your book, what yeah. what do you do? How do you cope with that? 
Um, I mean, I think, I think my, I think, so I think what, what, what really pains us as a, as a teacher is, um, I think really personal and like different for each person. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, so, and this is not a cop out, but this is really like my honest answer after you, you, you asked the question. When, when things don't work for me in like, in planning a learning experience and executing it and it not going well, um, I tend to like think on my feet or like pause and like, you know, move on to something else and recover from that. But I think when I need those like, I need a walk or like I need to talk to someone, like I need to, I, for, and this will sound funny, but for a lot of those moments, it's actually my boss. Like I go to my boss when I have like those like, oh my God, this just happened and I don't know what to do with it um, moments. Um, so I, so I think, sorry, that, I, I, that was just. <laughs> Aaron's taking pictures, go ahead. Yeah, I, that just like threw me off. Aram's having too much fun of it. Like it's the paparazzi. Too. You need to get used to the paparazzi. Right, go ahead, you, <laughs> so you go to your boss. For for me, the the things that pain me the most, or upset me the most, or where like I I like carry that heaviness of an yeah. experience long after it's over is when I have a curt interaction with a student. Mm. When like mm. I speak in a way that's disrespectful to a student or a student speaks to me in a disrespectful manner or if there is ever any like harsh interaction and this will sound like this will make me sound like such a, a softy or like such a pushover but really like I I very much like value the, the mutual respect in a community and when that respect is broken in some way and it, and it has to be like a fairly like big heated moment sort of experience but mm -hmm. when that happens that's when I'm like when I when I feel like off my game or when I feel like I get thrown off or I'm like emotionally um, upset to the point where I'm like I need a break um, so this is not a cop-out but I think what pains us uh, deeply as teacher, I think teachers is uh, very personal and I think it's different from person to person. So how you cope with that I think depends on who you are. Like when, when I have those moments, I find my, my, my like closest circle mm -hmm. and I like turn to them for support and processing and like how I should have handled it. And almost always I could have done something better and it's this very humbling moment for me, like, um, and and I learn and I move on from that. But when I fail in like executing a lesson, I'm like, oh yeah, like this does not. I just like restart or I refocus or I mm -hmm. reframe or I'll think on my feet and do something differently. But when I have that like terrible interaction with a student that really bothers me. And I don't want to paint my colleague and Pam or uh, Jenna and Clint's um, professor as a I person don't. who like storms out of the room because that's the opposite of who she is. Um, but what was there you know there's the the way I even learned about this conversation was that um, Pam and I were having a conversation about what wasn't working for us in the classroom, you know. And so she was telling that story, I think, as a way to get to the place that you're talking about, which is this happened, it doesn't feel good, i got to figure out a way to make it better, so I'm going to talk with you and whoever is in my circle of people with whom I can feel vulnerable. Will you help me figure this out together? You know, will you help me? Um, and that's something that I saw a lot in Thrive, too, that you seem to be recommending was 
surrounding yourself with other, I even wrote it down, Minu, because it was so quotable. Um, something about who connecting with yourself with hopeful people mm -hmm. who, who people will are in love with their work, I say. Yeah, and elevate your practice. Mm -hmm. I love that phrase. Um, I had a question kind of along those lines because one of the things you notice in this book is it's really social. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, screenshots of tweets or kind of testimonials from other teachers. And then, um, you know, I'm familiar with your work with Ingchat. You know, like, um, did you start out as a teacher saying, like, I need to get this networking thing going? Or did that kind of develop? Um, because right now I would think, like, you know, when I think of you, I think of this, you know, like someone who really understands networks. How did um, that all come about? Or? I so I've been I've been at Science Leadership Academy for three years, but I've been teaching for eight years. And many of the years that I wasn't at, at SLA, I felt uh, disconnected. I felt isolated. Um, I often say this, um, like if I wanted to go a whole day without speaking to another adult, it would have been like very possible for me to do so, very easy for me to do so. Um, I could readily do that. Um, and I, I, I knew I wanted to be a better teacher. Like I knew like if I just like had a little help, like if I saw some good examples, if I was able to talk to some smart people and I could get some like specific um, experiences under my belt. I knew like I could be better and I knew I wasn't as good as I could be like I was like oh but I could do this so much better and that's when I started a lot of the the networking and the connecting because I wanted to see better examples I wanted to connect with like I say people who were going to elevate my practice um, and it wasn't happening for me right where I was in that school and I wasn't being coached or mentored um, in a way that like could could like move me you know to a different level of teaching that I wanted to do um, and really for me it, <clears throat> it all started with actually um, Philadelphia Writing Project like doing the Summer Institute and like having this like just having this even an idea that like there could be a national network of teachers who think deeply about writing and thinking and the way students experience their classrooms like that like just even that idea that like something like that existed like blew me away like some people are like oh another organization but like I must have been so hungry for that kind of connection that I really like took to it. Um, it really transformed me. It really changed me. You know what, Chris, that wasn't what I thought you were going to say. When you said that about the social, I was like, oh, he's going to talk about relationships. And you did. <laughs> they were digital relationships, though. Um, and. And so I wondered, Minu, if you could talk a little bit about that. I'm going to try, and it probably won't come through, but I'm going to try holding a picture up from the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, Can you guys see this? There's this cool chart. My screen isn't helping very Works much. It's just fine. Okay. So there's this really cool chart in Minu's book, and in that section of the book, if you guys have it with you, it's on page 49. Anyway, it's talking. you have this spectrum thing here, and on yeah. one side there's, like, content, and on the other side there's relationships and you're talking about I think it's in a chapter about keeping your work intellectually challenging yeah um, in our class we talked and Jenna and Clint are smiling because <laughs> they know what I'm talking about but in our methods class you know we so had sort of this running conversation Sorry. <laughs> do you want to let them say it? Then? I do. Please you, say why it. Why don't guys. you guys smile? Go, hard if you want. No, go ahead. Go ahead, please. <laughs> no, I want to hear what your rendition of what I was going to say is. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in complete suspense. You are. Yeah, thanks. We're just trying to build it up. 
Uh, can you repeat what you were going? So I can begin and then okay. I'll, I'll give you a hint and we'll see if you can guess. You know, and okay. I'll say, oh, you're closer, closer. No, um, we've been talking in our class, I think, about um, the balance between, you know, what is teaching? Is it about relationships? Is it about knowing your content? Um, so that's what I was talking about, guys. What do you want to say something more about that? Is that what you thought I was going to say? Yeah. No, not really, no. but that's okay. Okay, all right. We can go with it. Uh, okay. I mean, yeah, I guess initially the first thing that comes to my mind with this, um, with it all, I guess, is like, um, I guess the scenario where we, we recently had to have, like, a debriefing day <laughs> in our class. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to talk about that. I, know, but go but ahead. I think it's pretty fitting for what we've been talking about. I don't know if it's. it's I can't. Go ahead, Clint. Come on. I get really abstract about it, but I'm not going to. Um, but we had to have a debriefing day, which fits into what we were just talking about with vulnerability, um, where some things that Cindy and us as a class had set up at the beginning of the semester fell apart due to just relationships and things people were saying. Um, and we spent. Two hours of just <laughs> letting it letting it loose. <laughs> it's almost two hours. It was almost two hours. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, I don't mean. But then I guess as far as this goes, content focused versus student focused. We've been talking a lot about um, theory, and I mean that's our whole a lot of our class is theory driven, and so a lot of people bring up the concept of like, when are we going to learn about content? Like, how are we going to teach content? All of this stuff. Um, but realistically, and Clint, are, are you talking about English content when you say that? Yeah, we're yeah. we're discussing specifically English content. So kids are asking, like, how are we going to teach informational so, writing versus persuasive writing? So can uh, I can can I um can I offer this and this may not that this may not um this may not get to what what you're saying, but but I but I think. Um, I think when you, I think when you, um, before you enter the classroom, I think you have a very different idea of what, how you're going to experience the content um, of your class with your students, what those expectations are before you enter the classroom, and then what the actual experience is. So most of the times people you know, choose to teach the subject that they love most, right? Like, people who loved English, like, tend to want to teach English. People who loved math and had great math teachers um, more than likely want to teach that subject. And I think where, where um, I got tripped up and where other um, new or newish teachers get tripped up is if you get hung up on the content alone, I think you're missing a huge, amazing, intellectually rich and rewarding part of teaching, which is like helping kids how to learn and helping kids how to learn how to think. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Like if you teach, um, you know, pick any great American novel, right? And if you, like, let's take The Great Gatsby. You teach The Great Gatsby and you kill it. And you have, like, amazingly engaged and student-centered and, like, tech-infused, you know, plans. And you come with your A-game and you know every single reference to gold in the book. And you know, like, every line inside out. And you can quote the ending, that amazing ending of the book by heart. But if that's all you do and your kids love it and they love you and they love the book because you taught it so well, I think, yes, you're a great teacher, like awesome, you did great, but I think you sort of missed the whole point of being a teacher. I think the really rich part of teaching for me, or at least my, this is my bias, is like how are you getting kids to learn how to read those things for themselves? or come up with rich questions for themselves and come up with rich interpretations for themselves and to do the thinking around 
the big questions or and the big ideas in in that work. I think if you do all the work and they're just like taking it all in, like, yeah, sure, perform for us today. Like, what amazing thing are, do you have planned for us today? I think that's a very limiting um, learning experience. But I think really, um, and I don't, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm one of those, but I think really good teachers get kids to think and to really explore their own intellectual like life, their inner life, and make relevant connections to their life, to their experience, to their worldview, and even like challenge those things. Like when was the last time a kid in your class changed what they believed something because they came to their own reasoning to it? I think that's that's like different than content. It's way bigger than any content. I don't know if that's like way out of the left field. What do you got, Clint and Jenna? I'm curious to hear what you think about what Mina just said. I mean, I, I think it's something that I struggle with. Where um, when I was a student in high school, I always I would judge teachers if I didn't think they had their content knowledge, and so that's always been really like deep content knowledge has always been really important to me, and. You know, I guess I, I get uncomfortable when, you know, I'm talking to the student and they're like, why are we reading Of Mice and Men? Like, why this particular novel at this particular moment? Like, why is this important? Why is this content important? And I guess I, I, I don't have my answers yet. Um, I mean, why but not I, teach but something I, else? But I think the kid isn't asking you to, like, recite, like, three top reasons why every, you know, learned person in America should uh, read uh, Of Mice and Men, I think they're asking you, like, why does this matter to me and to yeah. my life? Like, what does that, you know, like, what are you trying to um, get me to think about friendships or relationships? Um, and I think, I think when kids push us, like, why do we need to know this? I think we better have a damn good reason um, why we're doing what we're doing. Otherwise, like, they see through it, I think. But, Minu, can I ask, I mean, so this is, I love this conversation, but it's making me think about how it doesn't, and this is what your chart did for me. It really clarified me that it's not an, it's not an either or thing. It's no, not no, it's a spectrum. Not, yeah, it's, it's not like, you don't have and and it's a balance. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a dance you do forever. And some days you're more on content, and some days you're more on relationships, and and but but I, but I will stand by and say that my job isn't to teach a novel. My job is to get my kids to read, write, and think, because novel is just like one lens into the world or into the word, and it's just one very specific novel my kids should be reading a ton of different things and not just mastering one novel. Like if I teach 11th grade English and, and American Lit and all they learn, all they read and learn are like five novels that we got through, like I don't think that's good teaching. And I will stand by and say that and I will I've always I've always been stumped when I say I'm an English teacher and somebody says, "Well, what do you what are they reading?" Like, um, <laughs> you know, that's not the heart yeah. of mine. Yeah. Um, but, but and, and I would say that your chart is as valuable as it is. Um, the chart was was very troubling, actually. Like this chart gave us so much, so much trouble. It's funny that out of out of all the pages, you picked you you you, you, you picked that chart. Christine's the, review does too. But yeah. Yeah. No, and I no, I think it's a. Mm -hmm. I think I think we kind of got it right, but the chart went through so many like possible versions uh, of itself um, and we finally agreed on this. Um, first it had all kinds of things on it. It had way more text and way more specific examples of what each of those stands could look like and could mean. So I think it's interesting. Um, we, we struggled with that chart a lot. I was just going to add that, that I think both the content and the people you're teaching change 
right? Yes. So the, the, and, and the content of English, if I could just throw in this, um, the, uh, Jenna and, um, and Clint, the content of English, in my opinion, is different than it was when you were in school, even that close. And, and it's going to be, it's going to keep changing. So what the content is, is changing, and your students are new every, all the time, too. So you can never find the balance, right? Because <laughs> both of those sides keep changing, um, it seems to me. The, um, we're, we're, way at, we're close to being out of time. I wanted to ask you, Renu, if you could, um, your, I love the part about aligning your values with your teaching. If your practice, um, where right now are your values and your teaching kind of out of sync? What do you want to change? Mm. Um. So, so I and I, I kind of said this yesterday on the on the mm -hmm. webinar that I was on. Um, my classroom right now isn't very production centered. Like there isn't one thing we're making. Um, not in small groups, not individually. Um, we're doing, we're working on the college essay, and and then we're collaborating on a sci-fi unit with a with a uh, a physics class. And which you cool. mentioned, which you mentioned is not your strength, right? Sci yeah, so well, and sci-fi is not my, and maybe <laughs> that's why I feel all this like um, fear and and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, but that that aside, like. We're not like even though we're working on the college essay and it's it's a very important piece of writing that my kids have to get right because so much um, it, it, so much it depends on it. Mm -hmm. um, we're not making something per se, and and I feel like the momentum of the class isn't there, and um, that's my. That's where my that's where things are not like sinking for me. So what I want to do is reimagine what fourth quarter can look like in my classroom for next year, or maybe even this year. And I'm thinking about it and I'm reflecting on it. And I will I will make changes because, like you said, our kids never stay the same, and we're never the same. I'm never. You know, like I'm never the same person every time I go into the classroom. So even that, even that way of saying it, making is is so important now. Yeah. And you know, three years ago, it wasn't so important in our yeah. discipline. Yeah. So yeah, that's really interesting. Um, let's just quickly go around and see if there are any last thoughts. Chris, you've been in the chat room maybe a little bit, or anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I was just. Um, Hoping we kind of didn't get quite to it, but Minu's last chapter I thought was really powerful about empowerment and how we empower students. Um, and um, you know, I think there's just a lot there. And um, if anyone hasn't read it, I thought uh, just why audience matters I think is really important for me more and more as my students. Um, get involved with different audiences and, and they find a lot of, uh, there's a lot of energy synergy that happens in those places so I think you hit the nail on the head with that last chapter, Mina. Thank you, thank you. That Cindy. means a lot. Thank you. Cindy, Mina, you have any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah I'm just going to read what you said because you said it better than I could say it. Um, this is the introduction and you say, uh, the ultimate task for you is to leave your students more curious and courageous. Mm, I love that. Mm -hmm. Jenna. <laughs> um, I, just what you're thinking this moment. That's right. I guess I, I just have a question for Minu real quick. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you talk in your book a lot about like how you can not just take from your colleagues but give. And so I feel like as you know, going to student teaching and being a first year teacher, like how can I give back to my colleagues in this time where I'm taking probably a lot from them. Other you, know, than I, <laughs> you know, I I I think um, I think I think even you being interested and in, like having new eyes on someone's work and like having genuine curiosity and deep respect for who they are and the work that they've done with students and you wanting to learn 
from them, um, I think will be an amazing offering. Um, but you may have skills that they they may not have. Like you may know about, I don't know, like how you bring parents into your community of learning, and maybe like that's something that they want to change, or how you um, incorporate art and music in relevant ways into the teaching that you're doing, and they might want to get into that, or how how you do something completely unrelated to teaching and learning and that's uh, that's a new thing that they want to explore. Um, I think if you go in there and um, I think just like in your classroom, right, like you show deep respect to the people who come into your classroom, your students, and you expect that same deep respect back from them. I think if you have that same stance in the in whatever learning community you join um, for student teaching and beyond, I think you'll find rewarding. I think people, I think people like love it when you're like, "Hey, can I like, can I learn this from you, mm -hmm. or can you help me think about this, or like, can you help me think through this?" Um, I think people get energized by that. So you might just be that like spark of energy that someone needs in that community. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I something I really enjoyed, I guess, within it all that I've been thinking about throughout, but there wasn't really an opportunity to talk about, was the ed camps. Mm. Um, and I think that's a really cool professional development and networking opportunity for us. But I was thinking of it in the sense of you were talking about the science fair that your school like discussed in a staff meeting yeah, yeah, yeah. and how you could take these community mentors and uh, advocates that you have within your own personal network and create a type of ed camp for either your school as a whole or just your classroom that you may be collaborating with across district or across the city and create a type of ed camp within that uh, that students can either lead or participate in within. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What if it was every Friday and it was the whole school? <laughs> <laughs> Make them prove they learn things like, every week. You know, vote with your feet on uh, vote with your feet Fridays. <laughs> anyway, with kids, it'd be interesting. Anyway, sorry, Minu. Any, any final thoughts here? Thank you for spending this time with us. No, um, it just it just um, means a lot to me um, to have your eyes uh, on this work because um, all of you have deep insights about about this work and um, I respect all of you and, and um, I'm honored that, that you took the time to explore this um, this work and it means a lot to me so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you remember we had a conversation a couple of years ago about leadership and so forth and one of the things both you and I agreed on is that showing up every week <laughs> in yeah. editing chat at, at, yeah. at this is, is a vital part of what leadership is, just yeah. being there. Right? Yeah. So yeah. thank you for showing up with this book and um, and thank you so much. Um, we uh, show up here every Wednesday um, at um, it's at edtechtalk.com um, slash ttt um, and that's something that was started and is being, being restarted if you go to edtechtalk.com to find out um, by uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier um, many years ago. Thank you all for your being here tonight. Especially. Thanks Paul. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.